Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. This is actually our first webinar, and it's um, Building Brain Resilience, Guiding Patients Through COVID-19. And thank you so much for taking the time out here and being with us today. My name is Nusha Karhanachin, and I have the pleasure of being the Director of Operations at Kaizen Brain Center. Uh, our presenters today are wonderful Dr. Jennifer Sumner. She's the Director of Neuropsychology and Cognitive Rehabilitation at Kaizen Brain Center. And Kristen Osborne, amazing associate in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and Kaizen trainer and advisor. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Ahmed, our founder neuropsychiatrist, he's a memory disorder specialist a brain injury medicine specialist, and out, of course, our medical director at Kaizen Brain Center, and Dr. Christopher Nisinen. He is our awesome neurologist, uh, memory cognitive disorder, and uh, actually memory cognitive disorder expert. Um, today, our team will be discussing what makes one person's brain more resilient than the other, uh, what's happening within the brain during this challenging time, as I'm sure you all are experiencing now, and how to build a more resilient brain to adapt to these changing circumstances. Uh, methods to treat patient emotional distress, even dietary changes, cognitive shifts, and physiological effects. Uh, one thing I want to point out, the interesting thing about the setup you see here today, which is all of our Kaizen experts uh, on one call, formerly would be one room, um, is that this is actually very common for our team. Uh, we built Kaizen Brain Center on the basis of providing high-level interdisciplinary care to those with neurocognitive issues, which requires clinical perspectives from multiple angles, um, to really ensure that you're honing in on the true cause, the diagnosis, and the most optimal treatment plan for the patient. Um, at Kaizen, we really believe in the whole body approach and uh, combining brain health and physical health. So I'm really excited for you all today, and um, I'm excited for this conversation that we're about to have. And just so you know, the recorded version of this webinar will be available on our YouTube account and we'll link it on our social media. So, uh, Jen, Dr. Sumner, if you can go ahead and lead the conversation, that'd be great. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Technical difficulty number one. So, um, I really appreciate what Nusha shared. I think the idea of creating more resilience right now is really important. And having that capacity to recover from the difficulties we're experiencing uh, can be challenging right now. We're all under some stress, others um, a little more chronic. So I think defining stress in its acute sense and its chronic stress and its chronic sense is is really important because we all experience stressors here or there but we tend to overcome them our bodies and our minds calm down and we return to normal but what happens with chronic stress like what we're experiencing during covid can lead to longer lasting changes maybe physical symptoms like exhaustion or body aches maybe some sleep disturbance we also may feel a little more anxiety or irritability. It also um, might lead to some cognitive symptoms like poor concentration, motivation, and struggles with memory. So how do we combat these stressors, this chronic stress we're experiencing day in and day out with these stay at home orders and complications from COVID-19? Well, there are a number of things we we can do and different providers are going to talk about them throughout this webinar. Some might include lifestyle management, whether it's nutrition and exercise or sleep and creating social connection. Uh, another avenue by, might be medication changes. Um, I think it's a little the screen is frozen, I think. Oh no, she froze. 
let's see. Um, Relaxation techniques. We can also use mindfulness and self um, compassion. Dr. Sumner actually, it looks like she's frozen again, darn. Um, Kristen, maybe if, yes. if you can, um, why, why don't start? I step in yeah. and, and then <laughs> hopefully we can find out like what's happening with the internet. Yes. And, uh, and th this is great. We can mix it up a little bit here <laughs> and, and how wonderful that we're being able to experience what's <laughs> happening for all of us. Uh, inside our offices as we're working on the Zoom platform uh, most days. So, so here we are, we're adapting and uh, demonstrating our flexibility. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to when Dr. Sumner can join us again because I know she has so much uh, to share with us. So I am going to talk about chronic stress and how it can manifest into symptoms like indifference, apathy, and despair, and what we can do during these uh, times to help us feel better. My first question for all of us is, are we in charge of our anxiety, or is it in charge of us? And anxiety is an emotion that can either help us or hurt us, and if you know how much anxiety you are experiencing in the moment, then you can choose to accept it regulate it or manage it. For instance, during COVID, a little bit of anxiety can remind you to wear your mask or alert you to when you are getting too close to others. A medium amount of anxiety can create uncomfortable and distressful feelings when you're thinking about going to the grocery store. And hopefully it'll help you to remember your mask too. A high amount of anxiety can activate healthy defenses when someone comes too close to you without a mask. However, too much anxiety for a long period of time, like we are experiencing today, can manifest into symptoms that are difficult to live with. If you are a physician, a caregiver, a parent, or a spouse, here are six simple steps that you can take to be your own best therapist for yourself and others. Number one, embrace your symptoms. Instead of focusing in on getting rid of your symptoms, focus on accepting your symptoms and get curious about how anxiety is driving your symptoms. For example, if you or someone you care for is presenting as indifferent, apathetic, or unfeeling, instead of focusing on the presenting symptoms, ask questions to understand how anxiety is driving those symptoms. Are you feeling exhausted because you were anxious about going to the office during COVID-19? Have you shut down because it's too painful to grieve the loss of your friend or family member? Are you irritable because you are ashamed of not taking better care of yourself during quarantine? Number two, accept your anxiety. If you avoid the trap of solving the presenting problem and instead focus on accepting your anxiety, one of three things may happen. Number one, you'll get more anxious and we don't want that. Number two, you'll get calmer. Or number three, you'll be experiencing feelings that you've been avoiding. For example, if you find yourself obsessing about the COVID-19 numbers and you are overwatching the news to the point of exhaustion, you'll find it much more helpful to let yourself experience the anxiety you are feeling in a compassionate and loving way than if you were to attack yourself for being too obsessive. Chances are your anxiety is keeping you away from experiencing feelings that can be helpful to you during these difficult times. Number three, feel your feelings. It is better for you to feel an emotion that is healthy for you and leads to healthy behaviors than to continue living in an anxious and defended state. Unfortunately, due to our upbringing or experiences we've had in life, all of us have learned to avoid some feelings that can actually help us feel calm, content, and connected 
while also enabling us to assert ourselves in healthy ways. My mentor, Lee McCullough, Harvard Medical School psychologist and researcher, illustrates the heavy, healthy behaviors of emotions in this way. To laugh when happy, to cry when sad, to set limits when angry, to love wholeheartedly, to have compassion for oneself and others, to feel acceptance and joy about living. Next time you are feeling detached, helpless, or out of sorts because of our new COVID world, ask yourself to accept how anxious you are feeling, to still your mind and body, to let go of obsessive worry, to sense your feelings beneath the surface, and to listen. Do you feel a tear in your eyes? Are you experiencing warmth in your chest? Is there a lump in your throat? When in doubt, ask yourself, if I wasn't anxious right now, what would I be feeling? Experiencing healthy, robust, expansive feelings helps us feel calmer, at peace, content, and creative. Number four, take it easy. Most of us are tough on ourselves, and if we are tough on ourselves, we're tough on others too. Some of my clients, when I mention self-compassion, they say, I don't do that. I don't even know what that means. This is what it means. Acceptance, understanding, non-judgment for all you have done, for what you are doing, and for what you will be doing. For example, now that we're no longer living in quarantine, we are beginning to receive social distancing invitations, but we are not out of the woods yet. It is important to feel compassionate for yourself if you are feeling ambivalent with choosing to socialize or stay home. Whatever you choose, it's the right choice for you. Can you be accepting, understanding, non-judgmental, even in the face of disappointment from your friends and family, if you choose to stay home? Number five, reconnect. Sometimes drawing attention to the obvious in COVID and sharing what is true for you is the best way to build a bridge with someone who is struggling. You can say something like, these masks are awkward. I really miss seeing your smiling faces. Instead of focusing in on what's wrong, try to focus in on what's right. Ask people what brings them joy in life, gardening, painting, woodwork. Listen for any interest that you share and mention it out loud if that's the case. Sharing interest is a great way to increase connection and regulate anxiety, and it has the power to wipe away defensiveness. Make a point of praising others and expressing your gratitude. Go out of your way to notice out loud when you or someone else makes a positive decision to care for themselves. Advisor and coach Herb Cogliano taught me an easy technique to remember to thank people each day. All you have to do is just hold up both your hands and remember that you can make 10 heartfelt expressions of gratitude each week. And so you really ought to give it a try. It's wonderful to just go out of your way and tell people thanks and see the smiles on their face. And it really helps during this time. Keep in mind that going to a doctor's appointment during COVID times is an act of bravery. Not only are you taking care of yourself by showing up for your appointment, but you're also reconnecting with others. Make a point of noticing out loud all acts of bravery. This is a time for all of us who need to receive encouragement, validation, and support. Make it happen. Do it for yourself. Do it for others. Number six, follow your path. It's, it's important to remember that these are times of stepping stones, stepping stones into your future. Help yourself embrace the now and trust that this stepping stone will lead you to another. Every time you notice yourself shifting your awareness to the future, try to come back to the present and ask yourself, what do I need right now? 
If you know what you need right now, then you can make realistic plans for your future. Perhaps you need a vacation. Instead of hopping on a flight, maybe you can go camping or book a hotel with the pool closer to home. Or maybe it's time to just catch up on those projects that you've been meaning to do for a while. Knowing what you need right now will help you make realistic and safe plans for your future. All of us have wishes, hopes, and dreams. What are your wishes, hopes, and dreams? You are changing. We are changing. And the more we can accept our new way of living and allow ourselves to adapt to the changes under our feet, the more easily it will be to move into the future that is designed just for us. When you accept your COVID circumstances and respond in a loving, kind, and caring way, you give yourself the support you so freely give to others. Don't underestimate the power you have as your own best therapist and your impact on others. They might laugh with you, then stop by a friend's house for a socially distant walk. They might cry with you, then write a heartfelt letter to their mother. They might feel inspired by you, then bake cookies with their children and let go of worries for the day. Connection heals. Next time you experience indifference, apathy, tiredness, irritability, or obsessiveness, ask yourself what is under the anxiety, and you'll discover you have an ocean of feelings, stories, and experiences that just needed a little help to be seen. If you try these six steps and you continue to keep hitting the walls of your defenses, then you might want to consider medication to ignite your system to move toward health. Now, Dr. Ahmed will discuss how to best use medication during COVID times if necessary. Thank you so much, Kristen. And thank you so much for stepping in when, you know, uh, we had our little mal malfunction there, but I know Dr. Med, you're supposed to go next. Um, uh, Dr. Sumner, do you want to maybe continue your talk first, and then we can go to Dr. Med? You're mute again. I think you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just absorbing everyone's words, and I don't want to interrupt. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what people got and what they didn't when I spoke before. So um, I really think that Dr. Osborne did a fantastic job talking about stress and how um, it's affecting us during the time of, of COVID-19. So I'm not gonna rehash that. And I think she um, has shared some really key elements of, of self-compassion and how to care for ourselves, our patients, our family members. Um, I think some other tools that we can utilize to combat anxiety and stress during this time um, might be some cognitive skills that are things that I specialize in here at Kaizen. One of the things that I think people are facing right now are uh, struggles just solving problems that they have, especially because these are situations that are so new to us that we haven't experienced before. I mean, I know for myself, I'm, I'm coming against issues I never thought thought that you know I'd address you know deciding whether my kids go back to school in the fall or whether I'm ready to see a patient in the office or even at home if you know my friends gathering together is something I should be a part of so I think we're all you know experiencing these new stressors and trying to problem solve so one of the things I wanted to go over were problem solving strategies which are tools that I you know um have, have utilized for people that um, are experiencing any type of neurological injury or if they're just healthy individuals stuck in a rut. So one of the tools I use is adapted from uh, Beth Twomley's CogSmart model. Beth Twomley is a provider at UC San Diego and uh, San Diego VA and um, one of the acronyms she uses for problem solving is DBEST is the best way to problem solve. That's how I like to remember it. So it's uh, D-B-E-S-T-E. So the best way to problem solve means that we need to start with D, which is defining the problem. So in the case of maybe social connection, like Dr. Osborne was talking about, we might um, not know what to do 
do in terms of creating that social environment that we need? Are friends getting together and have we been invited to join them? And we might think, okay, my problem is how do I maintain social connection during COVID? And that's a really big deal because we need social connection for a number of reasons. So once we define that problem specifically, we wanna move on to B, which is brainstorming. And to brainstorm solutions means you include all possible answers to this problem, no matter how outlandish they may seem. So if I were to brainstorm how I maintain social connection during COVID, I might list items like connect on social media, try FaceTime or Zoom conversations, Maybe I host a dinner party. Maybe I sit in a lawn chair on my driveway and talk to people as they walk by. Maybe I start writing letters, which is a lost art. Or maybe I meet up in a parking lot and keep my car six feet away from the other car and talk to my friend through the windows. So some of these seem more, you know, pliable, others may see are applicable, and others may seem ridiculous. So I've defined my problem. I brainstorm scenarios, and now the E is I want to evaluate these various solutions in terms of how well I can implement them, costs and benefits, and perhaps likely consequences. So if I were to look at that quick list that I provided, I might include um, an evaluation of whether my way of connecting increases exposure to the virus. Does it put me or other people at risk? Is it gonna keep me safe, but then is it boring? Is it not something I'm interested in doing? Or, you know, in the best case, is it safe and entertaining? So perhaps connecting on so social media is safe, but it might also be really boring and we might just be totally sick of it at this point. Or we might host a dinner party, but really that increases our exposure. It puts yourself at risk, it puts other people at risk. And although it might be entertaining, it's probably going to cost us more than it benefits us. So then I might think about, you know, meeting at a restaurant parking lot that's pretty, um, that's not crowded, and I might park my car six feet away and talk to my friends through the window as we all eat takeout. Is that safe? Yeah, that meets the, you know, six feet requirement. I'm outdoors. Is it entertaining? Yeah, because I'm actually seeing my friends' faces. It's a little different. It's novel. So I think, okay, this might be the best answer to my problem. So then I move on to S, which is select a solution to try. Or I've done that, I've selected it. Now I wanna uh, try that solution, which is my T. You know, so I call my friends, I text them, I say, hey, we're gonna meet at such and such, six o'clock Saturday night. Bring your mask to pick up your food, then sit in your car, make sure it's six feet away, and let's chat for the next couple of hours. Now you've done it, you end the night, you come home, and the last part of our problem solving strategy is to evaluate that solution. And in that evaluation process, I wanna determine, do I feel connected? Have I met my goal of maintaining social connection during COVID? And if I do feel more connected, if I feel satisfied and fulfilled, then I check that off my list. I've solved that problem in a meaningful way. If, however, I leave that night and I think, man, that just, that was a disaster, or I still have that itch to connect, then you have the opportunity to go back to your brainstorming list and go through another evaluation process pick a new scenario and try that out. And you keep going back to your brainstorming list if at the end of your problem solving steps, you still don't feel satisfied with your solution. So this is just a kind of a quick, simple strategy that you can use as a provider, you can give to your patients to use, you can use with your family and friends or your kids or whomever to simply problem solve how to get through the different stressors of COVID-19 and, and after COVID-19. A big element of this strategy, which isn't always emphasized, is something that uh, Dr. Osborne talked about that I want to re-highlight, and that's this element of self-compassion. So um, Dr. Kristen Neff is one of the leading researchers in self-compassion, and she's created this list of questions to ask yourself or ways to think about how we 
you can utilize self-compassion to improve life satisfaction. And one of the things that can happen when we try to problem solve is we criticize ourselves. We think we may be doing it to motivate ourselves to do better, to solve the problem more efficiently, to um, have more success. But in the end, what happens with self-criticism is we actually are, are, are much less efficient and we don't feel as much meaning as we could otherwise. So how do we combat that self-criticism when we problem solve? So Dr. Neff suggests looking at personal traits and seeing if we're hard on ourselves in the hopes that we might change. So with this scenario of problem solving social connection, we might think, okay, yeah, great. I wanna text my friends. I wanna set up this evening out, but I'm too lazy or I don't have the energy to do it. I, I've become so kind of lethargic during COVID-19. And I'm gonna let people down anyway. It's not gonna be fun and everybody's gonna kind of talk poorly about me afterwards or just have a bad attitude about it. You know, these might be traits we're experiencing right now and they sound pretty critical. So one of the things we wanna do is be aware of that criticism and kind of get in touch with that. You know, are we beating ourselves up for a reason? Is there some emotional pain behind that criticism and if so can we sit with that and be a little bit more compassionate like dr osborne said and and one week way we can do that one way we can be kinder and more caring as a way to motivate ourselves is to actually use language that a wise mentor or a nurturing friend might use you know how would the most important person in your life motivate you would they use that self, that same self-criticism saying, you know what, there's no point, don't worry about it, you know, just wait till COVID's over? Or would they extend some compassion? Would they let you know that people just want to chat? They don't really care about the environment they're in. They're probably just happy to hear from you. And even a moment out, even if it's not perfect, would be a new environment that's invigorating or energizing. So one, recognize the criticism and extend some compassion. Do so by thinking about how a friend may talk to you or a wise mentor. And then um, notice, catch yourself every time you're being a little judgmental. If there's an unwanted trait that's presenting itself that's stopping you from solving your problems. You know, what's getting in the way? So this is how we might combine cognitive strategies with some mindful self-compassion because if we don't use both we may get stuck and not make the progress that we want to make this brings up kind of another important element in um, the struggles people might be experiencing during the pandemic and and that is that we do have vulnerable populations and when um, i think about people who are struggling with making decisions, problem solving, having good judgment. I think about people that might be struggling with neurological injuries. Maybe they've had a traumatic brain injury or they're in the beginning stages of dementia. And if that's the case and some of these executive functioning skills or, or problem solving and decision making skills are compromised, then you might actually want to come in and, and have a more thorough assessment and a tailored approach to treatment. And that's something that a neuropsychologist can provide through a structured cognitive rehabilitation program where they might teach more elaborate compensatory strategies and and do some one-on-one -on -one drills to help improve some of these weak areas I think that um, whether you're, you're truly struggling or you're still feeling like you've got things kind of under your belt here it's uh, important to to learn some strategies that are going to help navigate the the nuances of this time because like dr. Osborne said you know we're still in the middle of it there are still some work that we need to do. And, and if it's too hard to get it done with um, these strategies and medication might be the best bet. And I think that's where Dr. Ahmed may come into play and offer some really good insights onto how to treat people in this domain.
Thank you so much, Dr. Sumner. That was so helpful. I even took tips from that, really. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, if you can take it away with the third portion. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Nusha, for the introduction. So, um, you know, as Nisha said, I'm the medical director here at Kaiser Brain Center. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the, the key elements, uh, um, you know, at Kaizen, or uh, one of our main um, belief that is that uh, we believe in overall wellness. When I say overall wellness, I mean um, brain health and physical health together. We always felt that they go hand in hand and has to be approached in a very interdisciplinary manner. For example, we collaborate with other primary care providers who take care of the physical health of our patients uh, and uh, we collaborate with them. And, um, and we found this model to work well, you know, and a lot of our patients in the community have benefited. And, uh, you know, so I would like to today, um, perhaps, uh, you know, take some uh, parts of the model and see how this could be relevant to what's happening with the population due to COVID. Um, how can we help them through this interdisciplinary model? So, uh, you know, it's beyond doubt that COVID has impacted us, uh, you know, our brain health in, in particular, whether you're, a, you know, people out in the street or you're uh, even healthcare professionals or frontline professionals. Uh, I work at a hospital uh, where I deal with the frontline workers and I'm a, one of the frontline workers myself. I go to the ED at times. Um, I can see, I can see it on, in the voices of my colleagues. Uh, uh, nobody is fed by this. There is some degree of a direct or indirect impact. So, you know, so this has raised a lot of questions. Uh, so one main thing I want to address today is um, how do we deal with this chronic stress of this virus lurking around us and perhaps for a long time until we have a vaccine? And how can we build resilience against it? Uh, Two, I would like to talk about um, a key uh, strategy, which is lifestyle modification, and perhaps point out why it is important. And I would like to give a diff different approach than the traditional models with. So the first, uh, about you know, how do we understand, how do we you know, adapt to the chronic stress and build resilience? Now, uh, you know, um, Oftentimes I've been asked uh, by my colleagues, other people, do I have um, anxiety disorder? Do I have uh, you know, agoraphobia? Do I have OCD? Because a lot of times that uh, people are being exposed to as we open up the communities, um, you, there are some uh, elements of OCD or agoraphobia that's, that people are beginning to experience that is, could be quite different from the uh, COVID stress, as I call it. Um, uh, for example, as we open up and uh, you know, people are beginning to get back to normal, go out in public, there's a fear of perhaps contracting the virus uh, when they are in the public. And we call that as agoraphobia, where it's a condition where people have a tremendous anxiety uh, feel that they ha will have a tremendous bad anxiety when they are in an environment where they perhaps could uh, have maybe uh, exposed to the virus. Or um, some people may have the fear of contamination if they are outside and have to persistently wash their hands. Uh, so there, there are some elements of these obsessive compulsive disorder or agoraphobia as we open up. And people are definitely asking the question, do I have the disorder? It, uh, or they're asking, uh, you know, maybe I didn't have it before. Now, did the COVID bring it out? So I think, I think these are the, these are very important questions that needs to be addressed. Uh, I think, you know, uh, as we come out, we all there might be some similarities. Um, you know, it's a, these are fine line between, uh, you know, acute stress because of COVID, which is a normal response. I mean, you know, I, you know, at this time when with the global impact uh, of pandemic. If somebody is extremely happy and delighted about the current situation, I would worry about them because there is an, some element of anxiety and that's a normal human response. It's okay, we're humans. We will get anxious to some abnormal circumstances. So I think 
one has to be educated in this. Uh, I know I think the first uh, step to address this is empowering ourselves with the right knowledge. Uh, but that's not happening because, you know, we are in the world of social media, there's constant overflow of information and perhaps fake news that's coming in. So I think our first uh, ways to address them is, um, you know, perhaps getting the right information, uh, you know, getting, filtering our information, getting it from the right source like CDC or, you know, perhaps other World Health Organization, other reliable uh, areas. So I think that's absolutely critical. Um, the, uh, the second thing I want to talk about is, okay, uh, how, what is, what can we do? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, lifestyle modification is a key. Uh, you know, lifestyle modification is something to do, is a new term that has been coming up in the field of neurocognitive disorder, especially in uh, Alzheimer's, where we believe that it's an evidence-based uh, thing to help people manage an optimal brain health. And uh, it comprises essentially of many elements, but most of the important ones are diet and exercise that comprises of a lifestyle modification. So, so, you know, so there's a good scientific evidence of its implication in brain health and neurocognitive disorders. But um, what we have learned from this uh, model is that, um, you know, this could be applied to other conditions as well. And particularly now, the kind of uh, stress we are going through uh, during the times of COVID. Uh, you know, now why am I talking about lifestyle modification? I mean, how, I told you this, I'm trying to you know, propose a different way of addressing it. How different is it? See, the, you know, if I were, you know, given that the fact that we're going through a lot of stress, uh, you know, the traditional model is perhaps, you know, talk to your therapist and to, you know, as, you know, Dr. Osborne and Dr. Sumner talked about, you know, you know and come up with different ways, strategies of dealing with that. Uh, you know, at Kaizen, as I mentioned, we believed in the, you know, overall whole body wellness. So we have not just done therapy, but we are actually incorporated lifestyle medicine into it. Uh, we believe that um, diet and exercise has equal role to play combined with psychotherapy. Uh, and that's the alternate model that I'm proposing. Um, you know, for example, uh, you know, not just doing psychotherapy, but also doing cognitive brain exercise. Uh, uh, you know, so, so that's the alternate uh, approach. And I think, uh, you know, we all know when, you know, when you exercise, you release endorphins and you feel happy. And exercise also improves your immune health because your immune health and brain health are different, in, intrinsically connected. So by improving your immune health, you're actually putting up strong defenses in combating the virus. So it's a complete, this is connectiveness here. You know, so so that's, that's, that's why our, you know, the approach of overall brain health rather than just focusing on mental health is important. And that's been a, uh, you know, our model. And I, that's why I mentioned, I said, perhaps we can have the same model in helping our patients or people um, who have, uh, who are going through some degree of, um, you know, um, anxiety and other issues going on. So I'll just talk a little bit more about the lifestyle modification. So one of the critical aspects is being diet, right? So, so food is medicine. We, uh, you know, it's absolutely um, as important as uh, taking medications in some ways. Um, and uh, what is the right diet? Um, you know, I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, there are lots of different types of diet we have known, and most recently, uh, people asking about um, ketogenic diet uh, and uh, you know the several diets there. But uh, you know, uh, my answer is I don't believe in any specific diet. I think the best diet is a balanced diet where you incorporate lots of foods, diverse nutritive uh, of diverse nutritive values, and the best evidence of diet has been the Mediterranean diet, where it is found to be helpful in heart health. So and brain health. So, you know, but the only caveat is you have to be careful because the Mediterranean diet includes alcohol and then perhaps may not be good for your brain. The, the second thing I want to talk about is exercise. Now, exercise is uh, absolutely as important as diet. And, uh, you know, I trained at Wake Forest, which was one of the major NI centers for exercise and cognitive health. Uh, we know a lot about exercise. I mean, the best evidence for exercise is with moderate in to, uh, 
do a, a heavy intensity um, interval uh, exercise. Uh, so a lot of my patients say, well, doc, I walk a long walk today. Um, does it count? The answer is no. Uh, so when I say exercise, I, I say moderate intensity interval training. When I say that, you need to exercise so hard that you actually raise your heart rate, wherein you have enough blood going to your brain. Uh, a simple way to measure that is uh, when you're on a treadmill, you can talk but cannot sing. That's moderate intensity. So you go on a treadmill, do that, and take breaks. You do a heavy you know, run, then take a, calm yourself. So the, if you ask me which game uh, mimics that, tennis. Tennis, you play a heavy set, then you take a break, then play a heavy set. In fact, a lot of our evidence of moderate intensity or heavy intensity came from the game of tennis. That's how we got to this. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, but it's important. I mean, this, uh, you know, and uh, the initial guidelines were doing about 45 minutes three times a day, but there was another study from Mayo which said it doesn't matter whether you do 45 minutes three times a day. If you can do about three hours you know, per week, but divide it as, you know, at your convenience, I think that's equivalent to doing that 45 minutes three times a day, three times a week, sorry. So, so that's about the exercise. The third important factor is sleep. Uh, which is often uh, you know, um, ignored. I think uh, sleep is as critical as anything else because uh, you know, getting a deep sleep is like a vacuum cleaner for your brain. You know, just, uh, you know, we know that uh, you know, recent evidence has shown that when we actually uh, don't get a good sleep, we accumulate a protein called tau, which has been implicated in Alzheimer's. Now we, you know, in our memory ev evaluations, we take, pay specific attention to sleep. Uh, you know, and um, you know, and I think uh, at Kaizen, that's we also run a sleep clinic uh, by Dr. Nissen, um, and uh, you know, and there's a we have found out uh, with me and Dr. Nissen as we share a lot of patients, a lot of the patients who've had uh, you know cognitive issues, or oh, you address the sleep, everything gets better. <clears throat> there is a you know, it's a very simple fact. If you don't sleep, you can't uh, perform optimally with your brain. So there's no point in addressing uh, anxiety or depression or cognitive issues unless you address the sleep. So sleep is absolutely critical. <clears throat> then the last uh, aspect is medications. Um, you know, um, anxiety disorder is, um, you know, is different from acute stress that we experienced due to COVID. Uh, you know, it's perhaps more exagger. Uh, you know, it, it has a, you know, a stressor. Um, you know, um, there's an external stressor and there's a exaggerated physiological response at times. There may be hyperventilation, you know, feeling of, uh, you know, you know, a sense of palpitation, sense of doom at times, uh, you know, over sweating, uh, which we call it as a panic attack. So I think it is all right to, uh, you know, uh, try medications at times when you have tried everything else and it hasn't worked. Um, Given the current situation of finding a specialist to start or referral to start, I think uh, our approach has been to empower our primary care doctors who have more access, where patients have more access to them rather than the specialists. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would encourage, uh, you know, the patients to talk to their um, primary care doctors. And uh, there are some medicines which can be safely started, like citalopram, which is a very safe medication for um, anxiety um, or when lefaxing affects it at a small dose. Uh, and, uh, you know, and the, at Kaizen, we are often collaborate with the primary care doctors. I mean, sometimes, you know, they just call us and say, hey, what do you think? This is the patient, what do you suggest? Uh, so it's like a curbside consult sort of, you know, and without, you know, in that way, um, the primary care can start the patient on the medications and see the response. And if they don't see a response, then they trigger that uh, consult to us and then we can take over from them. But, but I think the first step is the primary care. I think they should be able to start without any much, you know, um, any significant fear of side effects or, you know, or fear that, oh, this is not my feel. I don't want to step into it. So, um, so we are here as a, for the local community of San Diego. This is for the physicians who are uh, attending this, uh, this webinar. Um, you know, we'd be happy to uh, address that. This saves time and addresses the problem right away. 
and I think it's good to, it's a good model of care. So, so I'll wind up here. So th these were my uh, uh, little bit uh, of insights about uh, what's happening with the current situation, about the, how, do, how do we differentiate from a COVID stress versus a real uh, agoraphobia or OCD or anxiety disorder, how to incorporate lifestyle modification that not only helps with brain health, but also physical health. By doing this, we actually could potentially improve our immune health in helping us mount strong defenses against the virus. So yeah, I will stop here. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you so much. And to all the providers and clinicians who are listening right now, if you have any questions, um, we will be available afterwards to answer uh, any of those questions for you. But for now, Dr. Nisinen, if you can uh, share with us your thoughts on building brain resilience during this time. Well, I guess I'm going to be the downer at the end um, since I, I specialize mostly in dementia and so forth. So I'm going to kind of take you for a ride here more than anything else and thinking um, how things change when there's actually a true problem with the brain. The brain is degenerating. And as we all know, the, the broad category term of dementia means a neurodegenerative disease where the brain starts having problems in different columns and domains. Um, through that usually comes um, impairments in orientation and through all the changes in cognitive domains, stress tolerance starts to change. And that can result in different or present in different ways such as increased anxiety and mood alteration. And then as the disease then continues to progress, it becomes more and more important to form routines. The reason is you can't easily make new memories. Now by repetition, enough repetition early on, you can still get information through. And by that, you develop a routine that gets ingrained into the long-term memory. And then that provides comfort and familiarity to the patients. Now, COVID came along, that disrupted the entire routine, of course. So, I'm sure from your standpoint and our standpoint, we have seen a lot of mood changes, a lot of behavioral changes because of it. And a lot of family members have had to deal with this and most have done actually very well. Um, but still, there have been a lot of mood changes, um, a lot of cognitive changes because of the lack of stimulation. Going back a little bit to, to brain resilience and health, I agree with Dr. Ahmed entirely, but one thing I would like to add, which becomes extremely important in dementia, usually I use Alzheimer's as the prototypical disease, but it's socialization. And there is something about that that just slows that, I don't know if it, well, slows down is a strong word, but seems to ameliorate the disease where people just function better. Through COVID-19, we have entered a state of isolation. And through that, we've seen mood changes, cognitive decline, and a lot of families with, with problems, how to manage behavioral changes, depression, we've seen apathy, agitation, delusions, hallucinations. Slowly as that has become the new normal, things have started to calm down. Now, what's the flip side? Well, this thing is going to end. It's good that it's going to end, but that's, again, going to be a change, and that's going to be a new stressor. So these problems are going to be arise again. So what you need to think of is how are you going to introduce back to the previous normal or the new normal that's going to come out of this? And like I said, routine is really, really key, but in somebody with a cognitive impairment, you can't just change things on a dime. You have to do things very, very slowly. You have to start building a schedule, changing a schedule, one thing at a time, very slowly. If things change abruptly, you can see agitation, uh, delusions, aggression, things like that. And this, of course, depends very, very strongly on where on that continuum you are. If you have mild cognitive impairment, probably not so much of a problem. If you're moderate dementia, you have much higher chance of having some trouble. Now, that mean, doesn't mean it's not possible, it's very possible. Um, you just have to know what kinds of steps to take. Part, part of it is educating family members, knowing um, what, 
how to deal with these kind of stressors when they come, not to challenge false beliefs, understand the feelings when they come, let them come, let them go, let the person express themselves. After a while, they usually calm down. Now, of course, there are times when things are just too difficult to manage with just simple reorientation, distraction, and pharmacological therapy does play a part in this. Um, and like Dr. Ahmed said, most of the medications are very, very safe. Um, we do not hesitate to use them. Citalopram is one I use often and have very, very rarely seen any bad side effects with it. And why I bring mood up, so that's a, such a strong thing, is that it can, mood can affect the level of cognitive function to a degree that we really don't give it credit for. And I'm going to use just, I have one patient who's my prototypical um, miracle child that I use using these cases, who came to see me who had depression. This was before COVID. And uh, she was a lady who has primary progressive logopenic aphasia, which is a variant of Alzheimer's disease. And the first time I met her, she was crying and she couldn't say, basically could not say a word to me. I tried some naming tests and so forth. She couldn't name anything. I was like, okay, you look depressed. You need to be, you need to do something about this. So I started her on a little bit of citalopram. Second visit, a little better, not quite as tearful, could do a little bit better. Finally, I put on the full therapeutic dose. The third time I saw her, she actually spoke to me. So when you, when you think about a vulnerable brain and the stressors that you put on top of that vulnerable brain, it makes things look a lot worse. And that's kind of where we're living now. And that's where we'll be living when this quarantine starts to break away again. And so we need to be very astute to these kinds of changes that happen happen and be ready to manage those. It can be as simple as just distraction, doing something fun, going into the backyard and picking weeds. I have, a, I have a gentleman who has two and a half acres and that's all he does all day is pick weeds and he loves it. Um, that's, that's his way of staying happy. But doing something the person likes, it can, it can change the world, change the agitation entirely. Now, then if you have depression on top of it, depression is not just sadness. Dr. Ahmed knows very well that there's this form of depression called apathy or apathetic depression where people don't do anything. And that's another problem. You can't get somebody to start an activity. You're still stuck in that, that same starting point. And in that case, you may need treatment for that as well. But baby steps are the key. If any, when any cognitive impairment, you have to take things very slowly. You can't push. Um, I always try to give examples, very simple ones. My, my brain is a simple brain. I understand simple, simple examples. And I always think of myself as like, well, how did I feel when I had the flu last time? Somebody would give me uh, a simple math problem. I probably would not be able to do it. Try living with that every day and throwing some stress on top of it. Or when somebody's agitated, well, Think, think of a scenario in your head. Try to put yourself in a person's sh shoes. Think of, a, think of a day where you woke up, you put on your clothes, you showered, 6 a.m. in the morning, uh, you're about to head out the door, and your wife, your husband, significant other runs out to you, and it's like, where are you going? It's like, I'm going to work. And, and, and the answer is, honey, you haven't worked in 10 years. That's what they can live in. So it's easy to see where the agitation can come from. And that's why redirection sometimes becomes so important. So you have to sometimes put yourself in, in their shoes and think of this. Again, some people are easier than others. Some aren't. Yeah. And I think that's one thing here at Kaizen we really strive for and why it is actually so important to have a multidisciplinary approach. One person can't handle this. There's no way. I, I cannot handle this by myself. Um, Dr. Ahmed asks me for certain, certain things. Uh, Dr. Osborne helps me. Dr. Sumner helps me. I barge into her office asking about certain cognitive profiles when I don't have a clue. You, so it really is a multidisciplinary approach. And, and one of the things that I think, with, even with the unrest going on in these days, not to get political, but what we need to understand is as physicians even, we are much stronger together than we are separated. Um, to end, I just want to say also is that even 
um, with these problems, sometimes we feel alone. And I certainly tell all my patients, I don't have all the answers. Most of the time, there are a lot of things I don't know. There are, there are resources out there. There's the Alzheimer's Association, there's Alzheimer's San Diego, there's Southern Caregivers Association, and all of these three actually have social workers. The social worker is your best friend. They know things that we could only dream about. They know places, connections, where we can get respite care, what, where there are areas for people with certain languages. I have patients who speak Arabic and Farsi, and they know where to go for relief for those patients so that they will have activities. So I think it's important for us. We always try our best. We want to do the best thing for our patients. We carry a lot of the burden, but we need to remember that there's other resources out there that we can utilize and that we can rely on each other ourselves. And by doing that, we can get through this. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nissanen. Uh, you know, thank you for adding the social interaction. I can't agree more with you. I mean, this is absolutely important. Uh, you know, and I think, you know, um, what Dr. Osman added was, you know, about, uh, you know, self-compassion, uh, you know, the, the apathy. Uh, I, I personally call it the COVID apathy. <laughs> you know, there is a certain degree of apathy, you know, with being shut down. And um, especially uh, I see that with my population with TBI. Patients with TBI already have an apathy, which is different from a depression. Um, and I think post COVID, I think perhaps there's a chance that this could have worsened and people may be even more apathetic. Um, and with Dr. Sumner is, you know, uh, not just talk about, you know, I mean, uh, coming up with brain training programs, um, not just, uh, you know, uh, to address the emotions, but also to direct, uh, to use some of their cognitive restructuring and coming up with brain strategies to deal with this day-to-day -day stress. So I, you're right, absolutely. Uh, one person can't do that. Um, and I think it's uh, often a team approach, um, you know, I mean, you're right next door, um, you know, and I, I, I think that's what we've done it you know, is just knocked on each other's doors and says, I don't know what to do, can you help me? <laughs> so perhaps, you know, uh, yeah, we all have limitations. And, and uh, I, I have no, uh, you know, I think, uh, I perhaps will always want to be a student of neuroscience. I, I, this is my passion, I think. And brain is such an organ where we still don't know a lot. We, it's constant evolving, learning, and a lot of times we learn from our patients. So, um, yeah, I think, I think, I completely agree with everything. And I think, uh, you know, uh, especially with the uh, uh, COVID uh, stress that we are all dealing with, I think we have to work as a team. And I think that's the key. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, whole team. This was a great talk, really. Um, do any of our participants have any questions? We are available and ready for any questions. So please feel free to send us um your questions in the chat or the q a section um in the meantime i'd love to share the story of when i actually sat in uh one of your team meetings where you were i think it was dr sumner dr nissen and then dr ahmed and you were all discussing a patient who he swore that he was having um, cognitive issues, but no one was really, no one was getting down to what was really the problem. Um, and I, I saw that back and forth uh, between you all, which was actually very interesting and funny for me on my end, uh, because you guys definitely do disagree, but then you, you have to, you know, show the evidence for the other person to be convinced, which is always interesting to see um, and hear, but um, yeah, so, and Dr. Ahmed, if you have anything to add about that certain case, that would be, or Dr. Sumner. I, well, think, I, think, yeah. I, yeah. I want to highlight just one thing, you know, both, you know, Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Niston talked about, and I'm sure Dr. Osborne agrees, is it really, this idea of not doing it yourself, I, you know, we're trained to know our field, but it just opens perspectives to hear from another discipline. It it opens our eyes and and like you said nusha just having our team meetings where we can come from our different training and backgrounds and share our perspectives it allows us to 
add to the puzzle piece, right? We think we have it all together, but then there's actually more pieces we didn't realize we were missing. And if, you know, as a community, we can do that. I think part of this webinar is to, you know, increase our exposure to local providers so that we can work together even more for our patients. So it's not just us at Kaizen, but it's all of us here in San Diego County, Southern California, because the more you work together, the more we can help these people. You know, this shared idea of science is really the future of not only uh, overall, you know, recovery and well-being, but also prevention, which is where we hope to take science so that we can kind of, you know, I don't know the right metaphor, but really try to decrease the amount of people experiencing the struggles that we see every day. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sumner. Well, it looks like we don't have any questions from our participants, but um, please do fill out our uh, post-webinar survey. We love to hear your feedback. And thank you all for attending. If there's any closing remarks from anyone else, if there's not, then I'll go ahead and um, leave this webinar now. There's stop yeah. this webinar. <laughs> so, you know, I just wanted to close it on doc what Dr. Sumner said. I think, uh, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm repeating myself, but uh, you know, um, uh, you know, we all work in different hospitals. I work in the community. Dr. Muslim also works at UCSD. So, you know, I think uh, I I just can't emphasize how how uh, COVID has impacted things. Like uh, it's very visible. Um, you know, in the you know, especially in the hospitals uh, and around around our general population. Uh, so. I think the key is to, uh, you know, uh, for us is uh, to work as a team. I think, you know, um, if any, if there are any providers out there, uh, uh, you know, we would uh, be happy to, you know, kind of like, uh, kind of collaborate with you in a way to help your patients. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the advantage now with uh, COVID-19 is the, uh, the emergence of digital health or telehealth, if you can uh, say, where perhaps I think you know the the uh, the it, it makes it easier for this uh, interdisciplinary approach. I think is uh, key uh, at this time uh, uh, with the COVID stress. So, so yeah. So I think uh, you know uh, collaboration is the key. Thank you, Dr. Ramon. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, team, and thank you for participants. And uh, hope you all have a great night and a good and safe uh, July 4th weekend. Thank you.